So Anne Rice passed on December 11, 2021, just earlier this month. She was 80 years old, and you know, some deaths hit you harder than others, obviously, but in the case of Anne Rice, this is someone who I had never met, I had never spoken with her, uh, but her death really lingered with me, which is why I wanted to talk about it. I had just written to her, actually, about six weeks ago because I wanted her to come on the program, and uh, not knowing that, uh, I don't know the timeline on the ailment that did her in, but it was a stroke, and she died of complications of a stroke. She was 80 years old, died at a hospital in Rancho Mirage, California. So she may very well have already been stricken you know, six weeks ago when I wrote to her. And I didn't hear back from her. So about a week later, I wrote to her again. And I knew it was a long shot that she'd come on the program because she's busy. She's famous. She's got lots to do have lots to do. And um, I didn't hear on the follow-up, but I gave it one more try a couple of weeks later and just said, you know, and uh, do I have a shot at this? Uh, let me know. And then I was on a podcast with Andy Ross. Some of you may have heard that. I was talking to Andy Ross, a literary agent, and uh, brought Ann Rice up. And uh, he said, who just died? And I was shocked. I had not heard it. It was, it was fresh news. He had heard it. I had not. I was really shocked about the whole thing. And um, I have to tell you, one of the reasons I wanted to interview Anne was because I had seen her interviewed before. And she just gives so much of herself. She's very articulate. She speaks quickly. She answers thoroughly. She's vulnerable. She's just a great interview. The kind of person who gives you so much. And she's never at a loss for an answer, regardless of whether the question is a good one or a bad one. And I've seen her ask some somewhat inappropriate questions that she just dives right into and answers without incident. What I would encourage you to do, if you have any interest at all, is to go to YouTube and just type in Anne Rice interviews. And there's quite a few of them on there and some extensive ones and she's just terrific so I was looking forward to doing exactly that with her and um, it wasn't to be it just was not to be but um, you know she, the, the thing about Anne Rice is I probably wouldn't have felt so connected to her if it hadn't been that my ex-wife was a big Anne Rice fan and probably most of you know that Anne Rice was the the author who really pioneered the vampire novels. She did a series of novels called The Vampire Chronicles. It is not the only thing she did. In fact, she wrote more than 30 novels during the course of her career. But she was famous for her vampire novels. My ex-wife was a big fan and read pretty much all of her vampire novels. And what was interesting among among many things about Anne Rice, who grew up in New Orleans, which fits so perfectly with who she was as a writer and the subject matter, the Gothic style, the Catholic iconography and imagery. But she also discovered in the late 1960s that vampires were the perfect vehicle for her it was, you know, late 1960s that she wrote a short story called Interview with the Vampire. That was expanded into a novel. And um, it features a vampire named Lewis who tells his life story to a reporter. You might remember that this was turned into a major motion picture starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. And what Anne Rice had told the New York Times decades ago was that when she wrote that story, when she used vampires to tell the story, she said it was the first time that she was able to describe her reality, the dark Gothic influences of her childhood, again, growing up in, in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans has, if you've never been there, it's 
a beautiful city, above ground cemeteries, because the water table is very high there. You can't really dig into the ground without hitting water. And she told the New York Times, it's not fantasy for me. My childhood came to life for me. And that's really important for a writer to find, you know, what channel can I use? Keep in mind that J.K. Rowling experienced somewhat the same thing when she heard her tell the story that she was on. I think she was sitting on a train at the time. And the idea of using a little magical boy came to her, you know, Harry Potter. And she just knew. She said there was even a physical reaction within her. She just felt it, that this was it. This would be the channel through which I'd be able to tell stories. I think so many writers try to tell stories and they they don't feel like they can really get the story out. And I think that um, oftentimes it's just you have to find the right vehicle. For J.K. Rowling, it was the magical little boy, Harry Potter. For Anne Rice, it was vampires. So she comes out with Interview with the Vampire. It was actually pretty well reviewed. The New York Times panned it, but a lot of other critics at other publications felt pretty good about it. Then she went on to write dozens of books, and not all of them were vampire books. She also wrote under the name Anne Rampling some, some uh, erotic novels. One was called Exit to Eden. That was a 1985 book she wrote, which featured sex slaves. And she had an erotic series under a, yet another name um, known as the Sleeping Beauty novels. It, it was an erotic series of novels. And her fans were so dedicated to her. I mean, she had obviously a very serious following. I mean, Queen of the Damned, which I think may have been her best-selling novel. And first printing, they did 405,000 copies of hardcover. That's a lot of hardcover, <laughs> a lot of hardcover books to sell. But her fans not only were inveterate readers, but they would show up at her signings. And um, she would say, I, I'm the most boring person there at her signing. She says, everybody else is dripping with velvet and lace and bringing me dead roses wrapped in leather handcuffs. And I love it. She told ABC News back in, that was way back in 1993. But, you know, she also said that what matters to her is that people know that her books are serious, that they are meant to be literature. And she's one of those rare novelists who was hailed by critics, not all critics, but she was well, she was critically acclaimed and sold a lot of books. So often you see somebody who sells a lot of books, but the critics say it's just cotton candy. Or you see somebody who's critically acclaimed, but the actual reading of the novels does not appeal to that many people. That wasn't the case with Anne Rice. Uh, the critics liked her, the fans loved her. And she said that her novels were, uh, and I'm quoting here, that uh, she said they're, they are meant to be in those backpacks on the Berkeley campus along with Castaneda and Tolstoy. And she said, when I get dismissed as a pop writer, I go crazy. So she was very serious about her art. Uh, she's a very sensual writer. I mentioned earlier about she did some erotic novels. Uh, you know, she kind of did that, and that was that. She got that out of her system. But her vampire novels were very sensual. And then, you know, along came Stephanie Meyer with the Twilight series, and, and that went huge. She sold far more books than Anne Rice ever sold, and... I always felt bad about that because Anne Rice pioneered the category. And here comes Stephanie Meyer, who couldn't write anywhere near the quality of Anne Rice. But hey, you know, uh, more power to Stephanie Meyer. She sold tons of books, and then they were made into movies. Anne Rice pa paved the way for her, and um, I don't think Anne Rice was ever anything more than... Um, in fact, I saw an interview with her where she said that she had no resentment about the fact that somebody had followed in her footsteps and done better than she had done in terms of sales. So if you go back in time, she, in high school, met a fellow student named Stan Rice, obviously the, the man she would eventually marry. He died before her of a brain tumor 
in one of those interviews on YouTube, she talks about how this was a very vibrant man, a very strong fella who suddenly came down with a brain tumor. And I think it was four months and he was gone. So they got married in 1961. They had settled in San Francisco. Anne Rice had earned her degree at San Francisco State University. She had actually studied uh, political science. And get this, she says that she was a poor reader. Uh, in her memoir, she said that she was a poor reader and, in fact, couldn't major in English because I could not read the amounts of Chaucer and Shakespeare assigned in the classes. Although later she would earn a uh, master's degree in creative writing there. They had a daughter named Michelle who died of leukemia at age five. They have had a son named Christopher who, happy to say, is alive and well, and he writes novels himself. But the death of her five-year-old daughter, Michelle, was, was, of course, devastating. An interview with a vampire, it, that book includes a young girl who resembles Michelle. So her, her daughter served as a muse of sorts. So after Interview with the Vampire, she followed that up with the, a book titled The Vampire Lestat. Then came Queen of the Damned. And then there were others in this uh, series that is called The uh, Vampire Chronicles. The last vampire book she published, to my understanding, is, was in 2018, entitled Blood Communion. By the way, it might not come as a surprise that when Anne Rice lived in New Orleans for 15 years at that time, she lived in a haunted house. She said it was haunted. Other people must have told her it was haunted. It was haunted by a ghost named Pamela, who she said she never saw. She never saw the ghost, but it was supposedly haunted. She eventually left New Orleans because she said a lot of hard things happened there, a lot of pain, her daughter's death, uh, her husband's death. And she decided it was time to, to move away. She lived in San Francisco. She had lived in Rancho Mirage, California, which is where she died. She said that part of her fascination with vampires as a literary device was that they could be seen as a metaphor for the human condition. You know, and she claims that uh, all of us make ruthless compromises in order to live. And one of the interviews I saw on YouTube, she was talking about how she always saw herself as an outsider and vampires are outsiders. And a lot of people see themselves as outsiders. They don't feel like they fit. They feel like misfits. It's very much a part of the human condition. And she saw vampires as a way of communicating that to people, their own situations and their own feelings about what it is to be human or what it is to be an outsider. And she was a complicated woman, you know, she was, she was raised a Catholic and she left the Catholic Church. She became an atheist for, I think, quite some time. She never really came back to the church, but she said that Jesus Christ was central to her life. I mean, after, after she became a theist again, Jesus Christ was central to her life is what she told people. But she just couldn't reconcile with the Catholic Church. There was too much going on there that she thought was mean-spirited. And I guess unforgivable. So she maintained her spirituality, but didn't feel the need to have it hitched necessarily to the Catholic Church or any church for that matter. So during her career, she sold more than 100 million copies of her books. She was married to Stan Rice for 41 years. And he, he was a poet and painter. He left behind... I think 3,000 canvases when he had died. She was quoted as having once said, I want to be loved and never forgotten. I'm really greedy, you know. I want to be immortal. End quote. Anne Rice, now you are.